While working as a park ranger, I had an experience with the supernatural. It was a scary ordeal, I must confess. A group of hikers had gotten lost in the woods, and my fellow rangers and I had decided to scout out the area. We got the general direction from the report that was made by their own families. Heading off in the direction, we drove until we got to the entrance of the woods, where they at last made contact with their families, according to the report. We parked the car just outside the woods and proceeded to search for them. We had searched for a better part of the day without anything to show for it. It was late in the evening already, and we had walked deep into the woods. I was feeling uneasy with every step we took. It was as if there was a terrifying monster hidden within the woods. A sense of terror suddenly engulfed me, making me break out in cold sweat. I glanced at my colleague, who seemed to have sensed nothing as his expression was as usual. I could not put my finger on it, but something eerie was happening in the woods. Suddenly, we began seeing strange markings, words written in an unknown language, different depictions on trees. What was strange was the fact that my colleague, for some reason, was unaware of everything. It was like he was in another dimension, detached from his surroundings. It was in that moment that it hit me, a dimension. Had he mistakenly stepped into a dimensional portal? Was that how the hikers had gotten lost? Had they stepped into it as well? If they had, that would explain the disappearance and why we were unable to find traces of them. It was, of course, a mind-blowing theory, so I wanted to test it out. I moved closer to my colleague, attempted to touch him, but my hands went right through him like he did not exist. I could see him, but couldn't touch him. I called out his name, hoping to get his attention and alert him to the danger we were in. I called out his name several more times, even radioed him, yet he continued walking deeper into the woods like a puppet on its string, being pulled. After my futile attempts, I proceeded to search for the missing party on my own. I came across so many skeletons and bones piled up into a small mountain. At this point, the terror in my heart had reached its peak. I resisted the urge to scream. I beat a hasty retreat and stepped on numerous bones in the process. What scared me was that the bones did not let out the usual crunch sound after being stepped on. Rather, they simply crumbled into dust. I could not help but wonder how long these bones had been buried there. This took my mind to the missing hikers. Were they already bones, or were they alive like me? Terrified and hopeless, I was at my wit's end already, and I could not help but feel despair. I glanced at my wristwatch to check the time, but what I saw shocked me. Time moves faster here. I had barely spent two hours in the woods, yet my wristwatch was displaying a date that was two days ahead. Two hours equal two days here. At this rate, my lifespan would run out before whatever was lurking around would kill me. At this point, all I had in my mind was how to escape this hell hole that I had somehow gotten myself into. All thoughts of searching and rescuing the lost hikers did not cross my mind. At this point, all I could think of was how to get out of my situation. My mind was in chaos, disoriented, and I could not think straight. Just when I thought things could not get any worse, I began hearing voices, and the feeling of being stalked overwhelmed me. I could feel something or someone watching me, and the thought of that made me panic. There was nothing scarier than the unknown, especially in a place such as this. I kept on walking, and my nerves were taut and on edge, ready to react to any situation. I moved on without a sense of direction, hoping to luckily find an exit or something. Glancing at my wristwatch, I saw to my utter dismay that I had spent close to a week now trapped in this place. While I was aware that time was moving faster, things would be different as long as I found an exit. It did nothing to comfort me. 
I had no idea when I would find an exit out of this dimension. By the time I had spent a couple of months, I threw a stroke of luck. I was able to find a way out. The moment I stepped out, my walkie-talkie buzzed incessantly. People had been trying to reach me and even my colleague. I radioed my colleague, but got no reply. I knew he was still trapped in there, and there was no hope for him to get out. He was not even aware. My story caused a sensation, and I was rushed to the hospital for tests and examinations. The doctor confirmed that my cells had gone through rapid aging. My cells had grown older than they should have. I would have to be placed on a special diet to prolong my lifespan. A few weeks later, the missing hikers were found. However, all of them had lost their youthful appearance, which further boosted the authenticity of my story. Despite getting intensive medical care, all hikers died mysteriously afterwards. My colleague disappeared, and I was told to keep quiet. The entire case was shut down before the press could even get out, and no public knowledge ever became aware. I am Jay, a 28-year-old warehouse worker, prefer to keep my last name anonymous. The event I'm about to share took place while I was hunting with my dog in a rural area I refer to as Black Bay, Florida. I've only recently felt confident enough to tell this story. I've kept it to myself and close family for a very long time. After several hours, I decided it was time to head back home before it became too dark to find my way. As we made our way through the fields, I hopped the last fence and waited for my large dog to squeeze through the gate. We were about 20 feet away from the start of the path when I heard a whoop on one side, followed by a sharp whistle on the adjacent side. Initially, I thought the sounds were birds, but as the unidentified sounds continued, I realized something else was going on. I took a few more steps, and suddenly, something let out a deep growl followed by a yell. It stunned me and confused me. I had never heard anything remotely close to that before. I managed to catch a glimpse of something reddish-brown crossing the path, although it wasn't much taller than me. As the noise subsided, I mustered the courage to make my way through the path and finally reach my residence. The only way home was through the path that this creature had just crossed. The sun was almost down, so it was a moment of flight or fight, and I chose flight. When I arrived home, my mother noticed that something was wrong. She was outside collecting clothes off the line and asked if I had heard a strange noise coming from that direction, but I couldn't reply. I was still in shock. At the time, I hadn't heard much about Bigfoot, but I knew that what I saw that day wasn't your average local wildlife. It was possibly a family of ape-like creatures crossing the path, and I have a theory. Now, I understand that what I encountered was a family, because I heard three vocalizations that evening. Back then, it was hard to understand what was happening, but now I believe I must have come between the juvenile and the adult. That's why they distracted me and ultimately scared the living crap out of me to ensure I didn't hurt their young. Living my life in central West Virginia, I have spent a lot of time hunting in the Monongahela National Forest. While bow hunting in a stand of red spruce on October 31st, yes, Halloween, this happened to me. This takes place back when portable stands had a chain that wrapped around the tree and fall protection consisted of two pieces of seat belt material one around the tree ran through the other wrapped around your waist. I was in the stand overlooking a small creek and had watched a couple of doe walk by and decided to stay until full darkness. The moon had risen early so there was some light and I had a flashlight in my pack. As I was getting ready to lower my bow, I heard loud wing beats heading towards me through the spruce trees, 
when all of a sudden, a very large owl landed on a branch about ten yards from me. I sat motionless watching the owl as it sat there watching me. After several minutes, I slowly turned my head to look back to the creek to check for deer one more time before climbing down. All of a sudden, I heard wing beats again, and the owl was flying straight towards me with talons extended. I threw my arms up dropping my bow in the process and screamed at the demon owl who was trying to knock me to the ground. Fortunately, the owl veered away from me and I didn't fall out of the tree. After a few minutes, I regained my composure packed up and walked out to my truck without any more harrowing experiences. Nearly a year ago, the people living along the river front near Preston were set agog by the appearance in the woods of a strange being in human form. When discovered by a party of hunters on his all fours pawing and neighing like a horse, their attention was first attracted by what they took to be the whining of a startled horse in the undergrowth. When advanced upon, the strange being ran off on his hands and feet, but the pursuers gained upon him so rapidly he sprang to his feet and quickly covering the short distance to the river, plunged headlong from a rather high bank into the water and swam to the Indian side. When he reached that bank he stood up, shook himself like a horse just out of a bath, and with what might really be called a horse laugh ran off into the woods. Some months later he was seen under much the same conditions, but this time west of Woodville on the Indian side. Only a few weeks ago, a man crawled across the road in plain view of several people, not far from where the horseman was first seen, but disappeared, the pursuit being somewhat tardy. Since Sunday last, the people living near Colbert, 10 miles east of Preston, Grayson County, Texas, have been hunting for a strangely acting man who crawled about like a snake until pursued when he would jump to his feet and outrun the fastest horses ridden after him. Others who pursued him on foot say they shot at him at close range, but the bullets, if they struck their target, seemed to have no effect. As late as last evening, children claimed to have seen the crawling man again, near the Varner Place, six miles from Colbert. A phone message from Colbert this afternoon confirms previous reports sent out from Durant about the state of excitement and the gathering of several parties for pursuit, but states that public interest has received something of a chill because some of the parties who were present when the close-range shots were tired say that although the peculiar being was in the open and very close, that he disappeared with the smoke of the powder. At the Varner place, he crawled into the hen house. It is stated that out in the field, a dead chicken, bitten in the neck, and from which there was the appearance of the blood having been drawn, was found. Though with somewhat reduced enthusiasm, the people of the Varner neighborhood are preparing for another big roundup this afternoon and tonight. It was the time leading up to Easter and our family was residing on a sprawling ranch near Malala, Oregon. Life on the ranch revolved around tending to our cattle, chickens, turkeys, and pigs. One particular evening, as we made our way home, the headlights illuminated an astonishing sight. In the glow, we caught a glimpse of a rare albino Bigfoot crouched behind some bushes, attempting to conceal itself. But it was too late we had already laid eyes on the extraordinary creature. Standing at an impressive seven feet tall, it sported long, flowing hair that cascaded down its body, reaching an astonishing length of eight to nine inches. The hair, a light cream color, was a striking contrast against the darkness of the night. In that moment, my mom jokingly remarked, looks like the Easter Bunny's back again. It seemed that this was becoming somewhat of an annual tradition, the third consecutive year that we had encountered the white Bigfoot, always around the Easter season. It would linger in the vicinity for several consecutive nights, evidenced by the howling of our dogs. 
Our ranch was located near the town of Colton, which had been mentioned earlier, making it a close neighbor to these mysterious encounters. Each sighting left us in awe and wonder, with the enigmatic presence of the white Bigfoot becoming a part of our Easter festivities, adding an element of excitement and intrigue to the season. Anyway, today in the car on the way to the store, I was looking at the sky. It was about seven or eight at night, and I saw this strange thing in the sky. It had huge wings like a bat. It was like a dark brown color. There were no feathers at all. The body was black, with short or no hair. It had a very slim body and a small tail. The thing about this bat creature was its size. It was bigger than a hawk. And in my town, we always see hawks, so I'm used to seeing them. I'm also used to seeing bats. This creature flapped its wings slowly, but the bats here usually flap their wings fast. That's the strange part for me. I could have sworn it was pterodactyl. No one believes me. I just need to know what the hell I saw. Please help. It was a quiet night in suburban Maryland, and I was settling in for a relaxing evening at home after a long day at work. As I lounged on the couch, flipping through channels, I suddenly heard the sound of glass shattering in the kitchen. My heart raced as I realized someone was breaking into my home. Before I could react, I felt a sharp pain in my neck and my vision blurred. I struggled to stay conscious, but my body betrayed me and I slipped into darkness. When I awoke, I found myself lying on a cold, metallic surface in a dimly lit room. Panic surged through me as I realized I wasn't in my home anymore. I struggled to sit up, my head spinning, and that's when I saw him Navy SEAL Tom. Tom was a tall, imposing figure with a chiseled jaw and piercing blue eyes. He was bound to a similar metallic surface, and despite his restraints, he appeared calm and collected. As our eyes met, he spoke in a hushed tone. Hey, stay calm. We've been abducted, but I have a plan to get us out of here. I tried to process his words as I looked around the room, seeing other terrified people restrained just like us. The thought of being abducted by aliens was horrifying, but Tom's presence and his confidence gave me a glimmer of hope. As we whispered to each other, Tom explained that he had been tracking these extraterrestrial beings for some time. They had been abducting humans for unknown reasons, and he had finally managed to get close enough to be taken with the hope of gathering intel and possibly putting an end to their nefarious activities. Tom revealed that he had a small, concealed blade hidden in his boot. With immense effort, he managed to free one of his hands and retrieved the blade. He swiftly cut through his restraints and moved to free me and the others in the room. As we worked together to free the remaining captives, Tom instructed us to stay low and quiet, ready to follow his lead. He stealthily opened the door to the room and peered down the dimly lit corridor. The walls were lined with strange, glowing symbols that seemed to pulsate with a life of their own. We followed Tom through the alien ship, our hearts pounding in our chests. The vessel was a labyrinth of twisting corridors and eerie chambers, but Tom navigated it with incredible skill. Eventually, we reached what appeared to be the ship's control room. Tom wasted no time in scanning the alien technology, quickly deciphering their language and controls. He discovered that the ship was programmed to return to Earth, and he set it on an immediate course back to our planet. As the ship hummed to life, Tom led us to the escape pods, explaining that it was too risky to remain on the vessel during re-entry. We all climbed into the pods, our hearts racing, and braced ourselves for the wild ride back to Earth. The escape pods jettisoned from the alien ship, hurtling through the atmosphere at breakneck speed. As we touched down, 
we were greeted by a team of military personnel who had been tracking the alien ship. They helped us from the pods, and we were quickly whisked away to a secure location for debriefing. I couldn't believe what had just happened. The nightmare of being abducted by aliens was over, and I owed my life to Navy SEAL Tom. He had risked everything to infiltrate the alien ship and save us, and I knew I would be forever grateful. In the aftermath, Tom continued his work, hunting down any remaining extraterrestrial threats. As for me, I returned to my quiet suburban life, forever changed by the experience. The sweltering heat of the Mexican desert bore down upon us as our special forces unit moved stealthily through the arid landscape. We were hunters, stalking the most dangerous prey imaginable cartel leaders. This was the heart of Mexico, a place where shadows concealed secrets darker than the night. I had been part of this elite team for years, seasoned by countless operations against the relentless drug lords who terrorized this country. Our latest target, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the elusive kingpin who had managed to evade capture for so long. The cartel's reach was vast, its influence undeniable, but we were unrelenting in our pursuit. Our coalition consisted of Mexican special forces and the U.S. D. united by a common goal, to dismantle the cartel's empire and bring El Chapo to justice. We had chased leads, tracked down informants, and followed every thread of intelligence that promised to lead us closer to our quarry. The desert stretched endlessly before us as we closed in on one of El Chapo's rumored hideouts. The intel was sketchy, as always, but this was our best lead yet. We moved with utmost caution, every step calculated to avoid tipping off our prey. As we approached the location, my heart pounded with a mix of anticipation and dread. The stories about El Chapo's ruthlessness were notorious, but I knew we couldn't afford to falter. Lives depended on our success, and the weight of that responsibility hung heavy on my shoulders. Our unit moved in, each member like a well-oiled machine, silent and precise. But as we entered the hideout, something caught my eye, something inexplicable amidst the chaos of the drug trade. In the dim light, I saw it an entity so bizarre, it defied all rational explanation. The creature stood on two legs, much like a man, but its appearance was far from human. It was covered in coarse, jet black fur, which seemed out of place for the time of year. Its eyes were wide and glowing, pulsating with an eerie white light. My gaze was drawn to its long arms, not quite as extended as an ape's, but hanging close to its chest. Its hands had only three fingers, resembling claw-like appendages more than anything else. I tried to contain my shock and whispered a warning to my comrades. But as soon as the creature sensed our presence, it moved with an unnatural swiftness, darting into the shadows of the hideout. Panic rippled through our ranks as we fumbled to locate the intruder, our training momentarily forgotten. When I finally managed to tell my colleagues about the creature, they scoffed and exchanged incredulous glances. They accused me of being high or sleep-deprived, dismissing my account as the product of a stressed mind. The mission took precedence, and they insisted that we focus on our primary objective, capturing El Chapo. Though I pushed aside the bizarre encounter for the time being, I couldn't help but feel a nagging unease. It wasn't until later, when I had a moment to reflect, that I realized how eerily real the creature had been. The memory of its pulsating white eyes haunted my thoughts, like a phantom lurking in the corners of my mind. Our pursuit of El Chapo continued relentlessly, culminating in a dramatic operation that led to his capture. The victory was bittersweet, for the shadows of Mexico held more mysteries than we could comprehend. Years later, as I recounted my story to those who had never ventured into the depths of the cartel's world, 
they too dismissed it as a figment of my imagination. But I knew the truth, that in the heart of darkness, where reality and myth converged, our mission had brought us face to face with the inexplicable, a creature that defied the boundaries of reason and existence. I didn't personally hear the noise. It was my father who shared this story with me upon returning from an early morning hunting trip. He admitted that he couldn't identify the source of the sound, leaving open the possibility that it could have been a Bigfoot. However, he chose not to report it, considering it too absurd. Based on his account, though, I am inclined to believe that it was indeed a Sasquatch. The incident occurred during the early hours of the morning, before the sun had even risen. Positioned on a ridge, my father patiently awaited the first light of day, hoping to spot any deer in the vicinity. As the sun gradually made its appearance, the chorus of birdsong filled the air. But as soon as the sun crested over the eastern mountain, a distinct sound reached his ears. Instantly, the avian symphony fell silent, as if abruptly muted. In that hushed moment, my father discerned the unmistakable sound of an animal crashing through the creek below. A peculiar sensation washed over him, causing the hairs on the back of his neck to stand on end. Instinctively, he felt a strange foreboding and promptly decided to leave the area. In recounting the noise, my father likened it to the echoing reverberation of metal meeting metal within a vast chamber. The sound seemed to originate from a considerable distance, possibly from the next mountain over, although he couldn't determine the precise direction. While I wasn't personally present to witness these events, the sincerity in my father's voice and the eerie details he shared leave little doubt in my mind that something truly extraordinary occurred that morning a fleeting encounter with the mysterious Sasquatch. While backpacking through Yellowstone, my girlfriend and I found ourselves in grisly territory for the first time. Black bears didn't bother us much, but grizzlies were a whole different story. After a tiring day of hiking, we set up camp for our second night. We cleaned up, had dinner, hung our scented items and food, and settled into bed. In the depths of my REM sleep, my girlfriend suddenly shook me awake terrified by the sound of growling. Convinced that a bear had invaded our campsite, she had been gripped by fear. Instantly, I snapped awake, adrenaline coursing through my veins, ready for fight or flight. Without hesitation, I reached for the bear spray. For a tense minute, we sat in absolute silence, and then we heard the growling again. To our surprise, it wasn't a bear, it was something similar to Sasquatch. It was tall, hairy, bipedal, and human-like. Startled by our presence, he quickly fled the scene. It was November 2012 when I was working at a small gas station in Northeast Louisiana. We were the only small shop and 24-hour service station in miles just off the highway. I worked the night shift. I loved it the sharing of stories with the traveling customers, that is when the rare customer showed up. It must have been around 3 a.m. I was cleaning the floors and locking the beer coolers when suddenly the lights went out. I pulled out my cell and used it as a guiding light until I made it back to our counter where I kicked on the gas generator. It lit the parking lot, the bath, and the hall leading to the register. When I looked outside, I could just make out the movement of the trees across the street, but otherwise it was pitch black. I turned on the radio and started listening to a local station with its night owl DJ, commenting on the heavy winds and cracking jokes between songs. Suddenly, I saw some figures in the dark. I could just make them out. They seemed to be a group of kids on bikes there were three of them. Two of them dropped their bikes and made their way to the door where they just stood there staring at me. I just stared back for a moment, 
waiting for them to come in. They never did. I moved around the counter and opened the door. What's up, guys? Out kinda late, aren't you? I asked them, expecting them to come in. Can we use your phone? One asked, their heads tilted kinda low. I felt a little worried as I pulled my cell from my pocket and offered it to her. Sure, she looked at me, and then I saw her eyes they were solid black, almost like ink-filled orbs. No, I need the real one, she said, her face twisted into an angry snarl. I pulled the door closed and flipped the locks. No, no ma'am, you go home and get your mom's phone. They stared at me through the door for a minute longer before turning away and biking off. The next day I had my boss check the cameras to get the pictures of the creepy kids, but the cameras had been off the whole time. Now the cameras run off the generator instead of the hall lights. I never saw the kids again. Three roommates and I went over to a friend's apartment not far from campus, but on a set of apartments in the middle of nowhere. We were just sitting in the living room watching TV, and I got up to go put a glass in the sink. Know how there is usually a window over the sink in most kitchens. So I'm washing this glass out, the light is on. There are no blinds on the window, just a curtain. I hear a sound at the window, and I look up just in time to see a hand hit the glass flat. I was like 20 years old, but I know I must have squealed or did some kind of girly scream, and the other three dudes came running in. I told them someone hit the glass. My buddy grabs his hunting rifle, and we run outside. By this time, 60 seconds have probably already passed. We get outside, and all we see is a bucket laying sideways under the window, along with the screen. There was a visible handprint on the window. Breakdown. Someone got a bucket to stand on, took the screen off the window, and was trying to open it, when the bucket must have flipped from under them. Outside looking in, you could see through the kitchen and into the living room where we were sitting. This person would have easily seen me standing there, literally three feet from them, on the other side of the window. There were four college-age guys inside, and this person was still trying to break in. One day in 2003, I was walking down a bike path in the back of my house with my stepdaughter when I saw two boys leaning against their bikes up ahead. I didn't really think much about it since it is a bike path until one of the kids raised his head up and looked me straight in the eye. That's when fear struck me so hard I was stopped dead in my tracks. His eyes were black and hollow like he didn't have a soul. It was like looking at pure evil, at least that's the way I described it when I recounted the incident later that evening to my husband and my other daughter. I immediately led my stepdaughter off the path, cut through someone's yard, and walked out to the street. I didn't know what I had encountered at the time, but now I am quite sure it was the black-eyed children. I don't know what they are but I know they are dangerous. It was so weird, I thought that my stepdaughter would also be aware of what I perceived to be impending danger, but she was completely oblivious, even when I led her off the path and onto the street. I somehow knew I had to get out of there now. Surprisingly, they appeared normal in every other aspect, except for the eyes, of course, and a vague awareness that they didn't quite fit into the environment. I only saw the eyes of one of them because the other kid had his back on me. He looked to be around 13 or 14, flannel shirt and jeans, and a swarthy complexion. Now that I have been reading about these encounters, it piques my curiosity, but I wouldn't want to run into them again. <laughs>